Hi, um, so I'm going to talk to you about rebuilding a select component. Um, this is a story of one component with hundreds of different use cases and millions of open source users. So we're sort of hitting that at scale. Um, let's just talk about select components for a second, because how hard could this possibly be? It's just like I could, I could draw this using lines and, and text. Um, Select components are actually quite interesting. They, they get a bit complicated. So you imagine you see a select on a page, and then the user focuses it. That's kind of interesting. What are they focusing? Is it a text input? Is it a control? Um, you then might open a menu and show a range of options. We've got two things that might be focused here. The first is the input that we, it looks like we might be able to type into, and the second is the first option in the menu that is also focused, and presumably some kind of keyboard interaction might interact with that. Um, you might get that menu and realize that you can actually group options in interesting ways, so it's not just a flat list. And then you might do other things with it. So this is an example of if I start typing in, um, we might get this loading indicator because we're currently actually loading the results from a server. Uh, we've selected an option in this case, we can now clear it through a few different interactions. Uh, we might want to style it a bit differently. Um, we picked purple, let's show them a little purple dot next to it. We might have a multi-select where you can select multiple colors or really anything. Um, we might want to style those options based on data embedded about each thing that we could select. Um, this is quite a fair bit of stuff that we're getting to. We might want to be able to disable the control or bring it back again. Uh, we might even want to be able to create new options that don't currently exist in the list, which of course could just be entered into a form, or they might trigger some kind of back-end process to resolve to an ID value that we can use. Um, Atlassian has hundreds, if not thousands, of select components. And I don't just mean like there's one here on this page, there's one here on this page. I mean like variations on the concept of a select component. Uh, so... Some of the things that we use them for include assigning tasks to users. Those ones often have a little avatar of the user embedded in the select. Uh, you might select states and options. We use them to change issues from open to closed, um, to pick components things are linked to. You could change filters if you're looking at a list of things. Um, you might change filters, and that's actually using a select. You're, you're effectively filling out a form at the top of a list and getting the new value. Um, also, things like in Stride, um, if you're adding people to a room, that's actually implemented using a select. So the number of things that this one seemingly simple component can do is remarkably broad. And when you start going into what these different behaviors look like, you get a few this or this, and this or this. And they can be searchable or they can be not searchable. They can be single select or they can be multi-select. They can be preloaded or they might have some async loading property. Um, they might let you select from existing options or pick new options. This is just the set that I kind of demonstrated before. Now, what's, what's the right way to architect this as component authors? So I've spent the last uh, probably nine months now on the Atlas Kit team here at Atlassian, and we are building the user interface library that the rest of the Atlassians use to build all of the products um, from Jira to Stride and Confluence, Bitbucket, and sort of everything else that is produced here. So the question here is, do we build different components? Um, that was the original choice made at, on, in, in Atlas Kit. We had a single select and a multi-select. And then from both ones, we had stateless and stateful exports. Let me talk about that for a second. So single select and multi-select are pretty obvious. It's kind of, you know, it was pretty clear before that we had two different types of selects, which is kind of painful because really, all of the rest of those behaviors, the async, the menu, the focus management, they're all shared between the two components. But we had these two because there are other things that were very different. But then stateless and stateful is a concept that's been floating around in the React ecosystem for a while. And you almost see a version of it if you're working with Redux, you get this concept of like smart and dumb components or connected and not connected components. And the way this was set up, um, stateless was kind of like the raw select component. If you wanted control over everything, you could opt into controlling everything. Um, the question is, what is everything? Right? Is it the value? Is it whether or not the menu is open? Is it whether or not it's focused? Keep in mind, you can't control focus. It's the one thing in a React application you actually cannot take controller away from the browser for. 
Um, and then we have this stateful version, which is much easier. You just drop it in, it works like you expect, but then you can't kind of break into it. It's a closed box. Um, so if I wanted to control the is open, but not the value. Um, this hard separation between different variations on this component, as well as this kind of broader concept of something can be stateful or stateless, started becoming really limiting as we tried to go out through the different permutations that products wanted to use. So what about one component? Is that a good idea? Let's have a look. Um, bear with my keynote graphic design skills. I'm going to try and explain the concept with slightly more than hand waving, which is how I usually do it. But imagine you've got, this is not a select. I know it looks like a select, but it's not. Um, imagine this is like a bar, a percentage bar of all of your functionality, right? That you might build as a generic select component author. Now what happens is, one particular usage of your select, they want to customize maybe about 5-10% of the default behavior, make it different, specific to their use case. Someone else wants to customize 5%. Someone else wants to customize 5%. What you end up realizing is that about 80% of your actual functionality wants to be customizable, but uh, not all at once. People don't want to opt in and out of different levels of customization when they're using a component, they just want to replace the bit that they need or the bits that they need out of like a total customizable set. And this starts becoming a really interesting problem. Um, so I have my own thoughts on this. I've actually been building selects for quite a while. Um, back in probably 2014, there were no select components for React and I needed one, so I made one. I put it on the internet. It's called React Select. Uh, turns out that that's not a small thing. Um, this number here is pretty scary. You know, when I was young, I used to think I wanted to be cool and publish open source the internet and have people download it. I now understand you have to be really careful what you ask for because if you look at my GitHub project, there's some really cool numbers here. Like, yay, I'm popular, I got stars. And then you realize, actually, no, I've got 800 <laughs> open issues. <laughs> This is the reality of, uh, of, of writing something, open sourcing it, and accidentally becoming quite popular. Um, this number here is cool, 46. I'm quite proud of that. That was at 200 back in uh, October, November last year when we were in the early stages of what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, so that was really scary. 46 feels like nothing to me today. Um, but so yeah, so this component kind of got a little unwieldy, I'm not going to lie. When you have that many people trying to use something and it's a freaking select component, uh, it gets really complicated. We ended up with over 100 props to customize all of these different various customization points. People wanted to be able to change the label, internationalize the thing, change the way that accessibility worked, how screen readers would read out the number of selected options when you tab into the component. They wanted to be able to render different options, different menus, portable menu, they wanted it to close when you select an option. They wanted it to open when you focus into it or not open when you focus into it or open when you, tab, you click on it but not when you tab into it. It's like, man, this is seriously complicated, right? Difficult to manage. It also had a bunch of internal state. Um, so internal state as in whether or not the menu is open is internal to the component, which means that you end up with 20, I, I kid you not, that is the minimum I've seen, 20 issues being open saying, I can't style this menu because it closes every time I click into web development tools. Because of course we move focus away and close the menu. That's a legitimate problem. Um, but also things like you're internally kind of keeping a cache of your options and you've got to synchronize that when your external options change or you're internally keeping the value so someone can just drop it into an HTML form. Or, React style HTML form, um, but then people want to use it in a controlled application and bind it to Redux, and it's all controlled by props. This is a problem if you don't have that under control. Um, it's fundamentally, fundamentally complicated because what a select is actually doing, if you're building it in React and shipping it in a browser environment, is it's basically the abstraction layer between a whole bunch of, like what, what you want is a declarative API for React, but there's actually a ton of imperative API going on underneath the hood. Um, and that imperative API is really important because you can't just respond to the fact that your input was focused. You need to know, was it focused because the user clicked on it? Or is it focused because they tabbed into it? Or is it focused because they just clicked on something else and you refocused it? 
and they might have clicked on the drop down and you refocus the input because that's actually where you want the next key tap to go into. Um, because of all this complexity, it had a really locked down API. Um, that meant that it was very hard to build extensions and this is where all those issues and PRs came from. Every time you had someone wanting to do something slightly different, they couldn't actually do it. So what they do is propose changing React Select in order to do that as well. Or instead, we got those as well. Um, not everyone respects what everyone else wants to do with your component, that's, that's life. Um, and it had a very sort of a quite complete CSS class name styles API. Now, this one is interesting because it was quite good. You kind of, this was a, a, a big requirement actually. Um, anyone can kind of style this thing however they want. You can either include the provided API, uh, sorry, CSS, or you can include the less or the SAS, we had both, um, and change the variables that we'd use for theming, so just change some colors. Or you could throw out our style sheet and just write your own from scratch, which means people could make it look like anything. It's great. Uh, the problem is that's a mix of some of this styling is quite functional. We need like the menu to be position absolute and we need certain things to be hidden or not hidden, um, particularly for the accessibility features and those would need to be reproduced when or preserved whenever anyone was changing the styles and that was hard to know. So we, um, we took a look at this like mess of a project in Atlas Kit when we realized that these components that we had were also basically going along the same path. It was becoming very difficult to manage. Um, you've got multiple variations on components and hundreds of use cases that these things need to hit. And we said, well, what do we do here? Um, and I was like, I really feel like I've played this game before. Why don't we have a look at uh, React Select and see if maybe we can learn from that experience and come up with something for Atlas Kit that actually not only solves our internal use cases of which we have hundreds, but also is a much better outcome for the millions of other users that we have. So we did that. Um, the benefits of going and leaning into open source is that we had a million testers, um, people testing our, <laughs> our code. That's pretty great. Um, we also had like hundreds of contributions into the project and I've learned more than I ever expected to about selects and also accessibility. Uh, because I've had PRs come in where people have suggested something, I'm like, wow, I, yeah, like that's a really good, I hadn't thought of that, but good one, thank you. And that's ended up making its way into this quite mature project now. Uh, we also have unlimited requirements. It turns out that all the people on the internet can think of all the things that you could ever possibly do <laughs> with a select. Um, and we also actually have quite a solid and scalable setup in it. So I'll show you this in a minute, but um, there's the whole CI process becomes really, really important when you're trying to manage a project with that much activity. This is uh, kind of like what Luke showed us at the start of the night in terms of having a lot of people contributing to a repository. This is a, has slightly different properties. Um, it's a lot of people contributing to a single package and only a handful of us are actually reviewing and then merging and publishing those things. But it needs to be really easy to see what someone's proposing you change, review code, know that it's covered by a comprehensive test suite and that sort of thing. So open source sort of forces us to be on top of our game from that respect. But uh, let's start again. Let's like rethink this a bit. Let's figure out a better approach to all of this. So introducing, it's the first time I've ever talked about it publicly, uh, React Select version two, which is also powering the new Atlas Kit Select package. Um, they are both open source and you can install either of them from NPM depending on how much you want your selects to look like Atlassian's selects. They're both the same code. Uh, so let me take you on a quick tour and then I'm going to jump into some demos just to sort of show you the things that allowed us to solve all of the complexities and problems that I've, I've told you about. Um, now if you excuse me for just one second, it's driving me crazy not being able to see what the next slide is before I, you're, you're, you're seeing my talk at the same time I am. Uh, so just give me a second to not mirror these. We are cool. So um, here are our design goals for like a select that can meet all these requirements and not drive me crazy. We need flexible data input. Um, this means people can feed it anything and then operate on that anything. I don't want to have to expect a shape of data from people in, in their options. 
um, which means we're going to need customizable operators, any kind of piece of functionality that might expect the data of options or values to be in a particular shape, since people can provide it with any shape, need to make some default assumptions, but then also be replaceable. That one's a good one. Um, we wanted to move towards extensible CSS and JS styles because if you've ever tried to maintain a large open source project that has originally had less styles and then had someone contribute a SAS port of that and then tried to keep both style sheets in sync for over a year, this is definitely something that you want. Um, the component injection API is something we came up with and I'll show you what that means. But uh, basically, with this kind of component, you want a lot of control over it but you also want to be able to give other people control over any of it. And that sort of diagram that I showed before where you want 80% of it to be customizable, people are only going to want to change 5%. If you make them change 80%, um, then really that's not a great thing. And also independent state management is really important, getting the sort of internal state that I was talking about before and making that independent of the implementation of the component. So what, we, uh, what we've actually done is we've taken this big box of flexibility and turned it into you know, a few key areas that can be changed. Um, and what that means, let me show you some simple code examples. So for the data, functions, components, and styles concepts, let's start with a basic implementation of a select. Uh, we have three options for some great meetups in Sydney that you could go to. This has the default shape of data, a label and a value, and we pass them as an option, uh, in as options. Now, if you just ran this in a create react app, um, app, then you'd get a select and it would let you pick from these things and it would sort of just work as expected. Now, let's say we wanted to do something a bit different and customize the way the label looks instead of having 50,000 props to do that. What we do is we let you define your own component for rendering options in the menu um, they take the data that exists for each option um, and then you can pass those components into the select and it would render for each option in the menu um, a div with the label inside it. Now we're just reproducing the default behavior set but let's say that we have logos for each of these meetups um, and what we're going to do is take that value now I uh, should have added that to my arguments but I was coding in Keynote so I'll live through that one um, we're going to drop that into an image tag in the inside of the option. Now let's say that we also decided that we're going to color code our options, make them a bit easier for users to see between. Um, so we get our colors and now we're going to extend the styles as well. So we'll take the default option styles and extend what React Select is going to implement and add the color in. Um, taking that from the data that's been passed from the user all the way through to the styles that get put onto the component. And there are other similar extension points. So if you wanted to do something like have a completely different data shape because this stuff's just coming off your backend server um, and you don't want to do a ton of processing it into an opinionated format, um, you don't have to. Uh, what you might need to do is override more of the built-in defaults. So tell React Select how to filter for options or how to Disable, like detect that an option should be disabled. Like, should we have a disabled prop in uh, property in that options object? I don't know. That's up to you as a consumer. Um, if you do provide an is disabled prop, that will work by default. But if you have some other condition, like you don't want to allow even numbers to be selected, you could very easily implement that just by passing that function in. Um, the same thing for selection. So we have like this kind of complete API. Now we're getting everything that you could want to change and allowing you to change just that thing whilst retaining the rest of the built-ins. Um, now what I mean by independent state management is this idea that anything that you might have in the select component that it might want to treat as internal state uh, has a prop that you can provide that would provide that state. Um, so if you start doing things like is loading um, and passing that in as a prop, then that works. And this is quite powerful. This basically turns our select component into a select framework from which we can build multiple components, all of which hit a much more opinionated specific set of requirements, both within Atlassian and also like all these people who are operating hundreds and hundreds of issues. My goal is to not have them ever need to open issues for things like this ever again. Please stop opening issues. Everyone on the internet. I need to sleep. 
Um, so at this point, you might be looking at this extension framework that we've come up with and been thinking, hey, but I heard, like, aren't render props cool these days? Um, and there's definitely at least one other major select project that's gone all in on implementing render props, and we definitely thought about that. But ultimately, um, so basically render props provide the ultimate flexibility of implementation detail. And that's actually not what we want in this case. We don't want people to have tons of flexibility. We just want them to be able to change what they really need to change and keep that to a minimum set. So if you think about it, like render props allow users to provide their own implementation. Another way of saying that is render props force users to provide their own implementation, which means all of this crazy intricate knowledge that we have about how selects should work that's been carefully designed and checked for accessibility, uh, render props kind of offload that onto the consumer, which is absolutely not what we want here. Um, so React Select controls the behavior of the component and provides the default implementation for each of its functionality points. But the built-in behavior can be controlled with props to a point. We got that 100 down to, I think, sub 50. Um, and I don't really ever want to add any more. Um, so it's controlled to a point, but then you can override the built-in logic where and when you need to beyond that point. So being able to extend styles and replace components is basically incredibly powerful. But I don't remember what I was going to say to that slide. Uh, but the point is that by default, we control the nuance, which is great for accessibility and touch support. So like, the number of lines of code that end up dedicated to making sure the screen reader experience is really solid, making sure that the keyboard navigation and the mouse navigation are both first-class citizens, and that it all works as you expect on a touch device is, um, is really quite huge, and we'd rather encapsulate that for as many people as possible. So, demo time. Um, quick, this is, I'm gonna need my screens to match up again now. Moment. All right, so um, this is the new React Select. I will zoom it in. Too far. Cool. So it sort of does the things that you'd expect. Um, this is the example site that we're working on. A uh, little cool point of note and shout out to Ben for giving us this button which actually opens any of these examples in Code Sandbox for you. You can just click it and play with them. Um, we have a simple select. We have that grouped select um, that I was talking about earlier. And we have a multi-select. These behave exactly like what you'd expect. Um, now, at this point you start getting some really cool options. Because of our component replacement pattern, this is basically all a select does out of the box. But because it's a framework, uh, what we want in Atlas Kit for a multi-select, uh, we've got some great designers, and they said that when you remove an option, it should, oh, it didn't work. It should animate out like that. So we can do that using React Transition Group, but React Transition Group is about 14K, and we don't want to force every user that we have to use that also we have some pretty opinionated animation um, sort of curves at Atlassian. So what we shipped was this animated components variant that lets you implement that animation inside of the same component. Now the way that this works is, I'll make this really big, um, in our animated set Let's just have a quick look at that example. Uh, we're pulling in the animated components and we're dropping them on the components prop. What these are actually doing is taking each of the built-in components and wrapping them in CSS transition group components and then returning the built-ins. So we're able to keep all of the built-in logic around this uh, concept of this is an option, it renders a particular way, it's got this cross button uh, when I click that cross button, the component will be removed. But we're also able to kind of get in the middle of what the select framework is doing and wrap it in a transition group component that manages the transition when it's removed. This gets even cooler. If we look at the async component, because we can manage things like the state of this input as I type, 
as well as the loading prop and the options that are being passed to the component, we can actually take the select framework, which looks, uh, I'm not going to show you because it's huge, um, but we can basically manage things like the uh, internal state of which options have been loaded from the server. Uh, we can tell React Select, don't worry about filtering the options, we're going to do that. Um, whether or not we're currently waiting for a request to return and uh, what to do when the input changes. So we've now implemented a whole async component on top of our basic select component without needing to fork any code or introduce any more logic to that base component. Um, another example is being able to create things. So we've got a few interesting things here. I've got my colors. Let's say I wanted hot pink. I can create it. How does that work? Similar thing. We have a creatable export, which then manages internal state and hooks into just the options, the on change, and listens for alterations to the input value prop when the components props are going to get updated. Now, I know that components props are going to get updated because I've offloaded controlling that state to an outside component that will, by default, synchronize all of the props that the base component needs to understand with uh, either props if they're provided or the internal state. So it's kind of, we've got this one place where we're just keeping both of these things in sync and all that complexity rather than sprawling through our base implementation is now just something that we can use to compose with our components in our toolbox. Uh, is everyone with me or am I just going crazy deep on this stuff? Um, I'll wrap it up in a second, but I want to show you one or two other really cool things that we're able to do with this, with this that I was surprised by. The first is actually this, um, this styled variation. So what we realized really early on was that if you've got to reproduce a, a component in order to just style a little bit differently, it's really overkill. It's like a sledgehammer when what you want is like just a little tap, like just make it blue. Uh, so the styling example that I can show you here, we came up with a framework whereby these style functions that you can pass the component take the pre, uh, the sort of pre-applied styles, it's then up to you if you want to extend that with another thing, or you could throw that away and just return your own thing. You don't need to provide a CSS and JS framework. You don't even need to know which one we're using. It's Glam, Glam's great. But uh, it's, it's really quite simple to work with. And we were actually, made it, we, we were able to retain the same flexibility that traditional style sheets gave people whilst consolidating the implementation of each of the default styles with the components that they're representing. So, the CSS for each group is this much padding, um, and that's all nicely co-located. So, uh, you know, that single value, this is the CSS for that. Um, you can either extend that or replace it with your own. Um, and because, of course, we have that principle where the user's data is their responsibility and we shouldn't care about it, um, it means that we can implement things like this color version where we're actually calculating different colors uh, using chroma to detect contrast and create variations on it based on data that's being provided with the options that select was never expecting to be there in the first place. So it's been really cool. Um, it's been surprisingly flexible. It's hit all of our kind of things that we were, like it, it, it did all the things we were hoping it would and then it did some things that really surprised us. Uh, this was an experiment, but we realized that we could actually create a calendar with things, this thing as well. All you need to do is this is crazy. This is a date picker implemented using a select framework. If I type in, you know, March, it's going to detect the month, use a natural date parsing library to give me my default option, and then let me scroll through these things with the keyboard like I would. They're just, they're just options in a select as far as the base is concerned. Um, that's super cool. This actually ended up being shipped now as like a variation on this got shipped as our date picker. We had to redo our date picker and our time picker and our date time picker, and this was going to be a big amount of work, and um, one of the people on my team last week was like, I wonder, maybe I could just use React Select for this, and shipped it in like a few days. It's amazing. So, um, basically, this is a new pattern that I don't think, uh, there's definitely some prior art here in React Router and a few other libraries around this whole component injection concept. Um, and Material UI do a really good job of theming. Um, we looked into that, but ended up doing our own thing regarding like the CSX extension framework. Um, I'm 
kind of really keen if anyone is using selects in a React app, um, check it out, give me feedback. Uh, we feel like we're sort of doing some new things with this that hopefully will reduce my issue count and help me get more sleep, as well as make all the selects that people use across all of Atlassian's projects a uh, much more uh, a nicer and more consistent user experience. So uh, it's in alpha, it will be released, um, I've been saying February, that is, we're getting close, but um, it should be soon. So that's it, um, some quick learnings, selects are hard, don't build one, use React Select, thank you.